Okay, so we'll start the lecture now. So we will talk about the macro sequencer design. Please remember what we considered in the last two classes. We considered the overall block diagram of the microprogram controller. We considered the interface between the data part and control part. In the microprogram controller, we had three main components. We have the micro sequencer, the control ROM, and the register. Control ROM and register we already considered. We had to just find their sizes. There's nothing really involved. And of course, we had to also find the contents of the control ROM. We went through an example where we designed the complete microprogram controller, but what we left as a black box was the micro sequencer. So what today we are going to discuss is how the micro sequencer is designed, what are the steps involved, and see a implementation of a micro sequencer for that particular example that we started doing for the GCD example. Then later on we will consider how can we talk in terms of a more complex micro sequencer, all is a fairly simple example, and what are the issues involved there. So the first thing that one should be clear is what what is the role of a micro sequencer? The role of a micro sequencer, the micro sequencer is to generate the next address. So this next address is an input to the control ROM. It defines what is going to be the set of control signals that are going to appear in the next clock cycle. Please remember we have a register sitting in between the control ROM and the data part. And the register is going to latch the control signals. So primarily this address will address the ROM and we'll, we will get the set of control signals for the next clock cycle. So how do we go about doing it? First we enumerate the micro sequencer instructions that need to be supported. So we already defined some micro sequencer instructions last time for that example. We will start from there. But it enumerates the micro sequencer instructions. Identify once we are done this, we will identify all the inputs to the next address multiplexer. The next address multiplexer, as we will see, is the key component in the micro sequencer. And we have to see what are the choices that are required to be given as an input to this next address multiplexer. We will see that. And then finally, we synthesize the logic for the select input of the next address multiplexer. And once we do it, the sequencer design is complete. First, we will go through a simple example to do that. The same example where we have already identified the set of micro sequencer instructions. The three micro sequencer instructions that we said, this is of course comes from the type of control flow that needs to be supported. From the control flow that needs to be supported, we have identified three of them, the next conditional jump and jump. Please remember this conditional jump works on a condition and which condition it works on in a particular state or in a particular micro instruction is decided by the multiplexer for the status. For all the conditions, you have a condition multiplexer and that decides this. So we have some encoding. Of course, this encoding is critical only for one part of it, but anyway, I have given some encoding for each of these. So what is the type of a sequencer, micro sequencer required for it? I have drawn a Max sequencer over here. Let us first consider what are the components here. What are the input output? This as a block diagram is the max sequencer and a key part of it is the next address multiplexer. Uh, almost all micro sequencers will contain an extra address multiplexer except something which is let us say a purely a se sequence without needing any change, if we let us say you have to just generate a set of states over and over again, then a sequencer could be just a counter. A counter can act as a sequencer and that can generate the address inputs to the ROM and in the ROM you are storing the sequence required and then uh, the control se sequence required and you can output it. But anything more complex will require a multiplexer and this is the multiplexer that I am talking about. So this is a key component over here and this multiplexer has some inputs. And it is, first of all, a sequencers d differ in the type of inputs that this multiplexer has. In this case, I have only two inputs to the multiplexer. Of course, I can encode them. Once I have multiplexer input, I can say 0, 1, 0th input and 1st input. If I have two inputs, I will have one select line. 
if I have more than three, in, uh, three inputs, I have two select lines. So that's so there is a microprogram counter. This microprogram counter is somewhat similar to a program counter, except that now it's at the micro programming level. So it's at a lower level than typically the way the program counter works. Just like program counter keeps track in a processor of the machine instruction that is being executed and you increment it to get the next machine instruction. A microprogram counter keeps track of the micro instruction being executed and you can increment it to get the next micro instruction. This plus one is nothing but an incrementer. So there is a combination logic and this microprogram counter of course is a register, so it is a sequential logic and there will be a clock that will be required. So as far as this micro sequencer is concerned, the only clock input is going to the microprogram counter. Of course, I am calling it a counter, but it's basically it is a register. The counter aspect is extracted out in terms of this incrementer. And this is a loop and this loop obviously cannot be a combinational loop. We all know that. Any such loop, unless you are doing an asynchronous circuit design, so any such loop is going to be a sequential broken by a register, in this case it is broken by a register latch and this is the clock that, because the clock input to the sequencer is implicit. So what is happening here? This branch address is coming from the microprogram, it is coming from the micro instruction. The width of this, all these have a width which is number of bits required to address the control ROM. It depends upon the size of the control ROM. I think we took this value to be n. Yeah, so. so, in the example that we had, this value was 3 because we had only 7 micro instructions and for to address that we needed 3 of them. So, I have now 2 choices here. I can either choose this or I can choose this. Either I can go to the next micro instruction the way that I will go to the next micro instruction is I will always latch this, there is no control over here, each time it is going to be loaded with whatever is the micro instruction address I am generating, that address is going to go and the next address is available as an input to the multiplexer. So now the choice, what is going to be chosen is going to be determined by the select logic because the select logic is something which is go acting as an input giving the S input to this. And what is the input to the select logic? The two inputs to the select logic for this example, one is the condition and another is the micro sequencer instruction. Remember that these paths are all, they are almost like a data path, except that we are now talking within the control part. All of the sequencer is part of the control, but it is more almost like a data path because they all are wide, but the width of this has nothing to do with the width of the data operations. The width of these is going to be determined by the size of the address lines to the microprogram and not by the, so you may be performing 16 bit operations of data, but this may only be 3 bits or 4 bits or 5 bits depending on how many, but they otherwise look like a data. you have a counter, you have an incrementer, you have a multiplexer and later on as we will see that we can have more components over here. Now let us complete this. So as once we are determined, so basically how have we arrived at these two inputs is important. The way we have arrived at is looking at these instructions. To support these instructions, I only require these two inputs. The rest of it goes into the select logic and let me define the functionality of the select logic before I design it. The functionality of this select logic, which is the next address select logic, so I have this micro sequencer instruction, I have two bits I1, I0, this was the next conditional jump, conditional jump, jump and this is undefined. So I am drawing this, uh, you can say the truth table or the specification for this. I1, I0, if it is next, I do not care what the condition is, I am going to generate the select in output that I am going to generate is 0. What does the 0 mean? The 0 essentially means I am going to select this path in my multiplexer, that is the implication. So when it is, instruction is I1 is 0 and I0 is 1, then Depending on what the condition is, if condition is going to be 0, I am going to generate 0. If condition is going to be 1, I am going to generate 1. 
basically as far as this conditional jump is concerned the condition determines whether i choose this path or this path and when i go for the jump which is which encoding i chosen is 1 0 so here i don't care about the condition i am going to generate my next address select to be 1 and for 1 1 because i don't have any micro sequencer instruction like this i don't care what the condition is i don't care what the output is because I am not going to have this 1 1 coming at all so I can use this to do my. So, second and third row both of them correspond to conditional jump okay because what is happening over here is what do I need depending on when if the condition is true if the condition is true I want to branch if the condition is false I just want to go to the next micro instruction this is what a conditional jump instruction here means basically I am implementing that if then else type of structure there and so I am supplying the address over here but this address may not be selected the branch address may not always be selected whether it is selected or I go to the next micro instruction depends upon the condition and that is what is being represented here in terms of these two rows both these rows are 0 1 0 I select condition is false I just go to the next micro instruction when I select 0 that means I go to the next micro instruction the next address multiplexer will select the incremented value if I have 0 1 1 I am going to select the branch address and that means I perform a jump so that is how I implement a conditional jump so once I have this specification then rest of it is trivial I just minimize my design of my conditional logic is nothing but I write the condition for this so it is whatever um, so I can write the logic that I require for s so if this is 1 0 1 1 so this can be 1 1 is do not care so if I minimize to so this can also I can take it to be 1 because it is anyway do not care so it is i 1 plus as far as this is concerned is 0 1 1 and what will it be i0 the condition for this ok <coughs> so because this 1 1 is coming so I can eliminate 1 1 1 with this also so I have this uh, equation that I can derive and that is the logic that I have for this select. So once I have done it, my design now is complete. I have a micro sequencer. I have the control ROM. I already have the contents of the control ROM, and I have the register and I have the interface to the data part. So the whole so we have been able to design one controller proceeding in a very structured manner. That's the most important thing. Okay, you can always design some ad hoc controller, but important thing is one can go through the structured manner, and actually the whole thing can even be automated because once you have that type of a structured design methodology you can even automate such a process of course there are uh, other optimization issues involved which we will take up later on but let us now go from this to talk about a generic micro sequencer see one thing one great advantage about microprogram control is there are not too many options about what type of sequence control actions are required what type of transitions are required if you consider the state diagram so they are only very limited options and if we consider have a micro sequencer which takes care of all these options then most of the time your actual design process is just cutting it down to size cutting it down to the requirements of your design so let's see what are the other type of options that typically micro sequencer have so this particular model of a micro sequencer i have taken from a standard chip called amd 2910 it is a very popular micro sequencer and this supports a number of micro sequencing options and I have put those options over here. One can actually even extend it, one can even make it a little more complex but most of the micro sequencing can be done, requirements of most of the applications can be accommodated over here. So the sequencer itself is more complex but let us see what is the type of additions that are performed. Primarily as I said the key component is the next address multiplexer and I have increased the options available for the next address multiplexer. 
I'm not saying you know you can say zero, one, two, three, but that's uh, you know the encoding part that can be taken care of. If you change the order, you need to have a change select logic. That's all. But basically, the options are important from the point of view of what type of sequencing is required. I've added a tri-state buffer and an output enable. So what this tri-state buffer does is, if you need to have more than one micro sequencer for some reason, you can tie them up and enable one of them. So it also allows you to have more than one micro sequencer. Or in some cases, as later on we will see that you can also have need not be two micro sequencers, but there could be another address source for some part of the application, there may be an addressing logic may be different and I can have another source for generating the address and I can try. So this could be a micro sequencer 1, micro sequencer 2 and it could be some, it could be any, some other address source that can supply the address for the, after all, all this is going to the control row as an address. So what this output enable allows me to do is to tie up more than one address source for generating the next address. So let's omit that. That's the only role that this tri-state buffer plays. This path we have already considered. The role of this path is to generate the next address. Of course, it is broken by the clock here. Now let's look at why do we need a stack. This is a component, if you, just like you have procedures or functions calls in your high level program, at the micro program level also, if I need to support what are called micro routines, if I need to support micro routines, okay, micro routines, what are these micro routines? Micro routines are set of micro instructions which can be invoked from different part of your micro program. So you can just take an analogy from where they you have the, and the advantages are the same. You actually save in terms of the space that is required. In the same set of micro instructions need to be performed over and over again. You don't have to have multiple copies of them. You can just store one copy of it, those set of micro instructions and perform a jump to that set of micro routine and return back. If I one need to do that, then you need to have a stack. And what this stack does is, when you are executing an instruction and this particular instruction says jump to the subroutine, then the return address gets automatically pushed into the stack. Because what I am going to have here is if I am executing a particular instruction, I am going to have the next instruction over here and I can whatever, so I can take the, the present instruction address is stored over here which is being executed, so the next instruction goes address of that goes and push into the stack. And when I say return, this is a return is an option, an extra address option and it comes from the stack and that address gets chosen. When I say return from the sub micro routine. Please remember, what is the difference between this and normal procedure or function calls or subroutines that you have in high level language? This is a purely a control action. So what it means is, this particular stack is only capable of storing the return addresses, return micro instruction addresses. If you need to do, like for example, when you go make a function call, if you need to have store the parameters and so on or register values and things like that, if the context needs to be stored, that you have to provide separately in the data path. And you have to do that at the beginning of your micro routine, whatever context that needs to be stored, those registers need to be saved. There is no path here to this stack which exists from the data. This stack cannot be used to store your register values or any other data values or, or to pass parameters and so on and so forth. Nothing can be done using this. So what this can do is only store the micro -root. Typically, this is implemented to give you speed because in one clock cycle, you can now call a micro routine. And the same set of micro instructions, of course, can be called from different places. And generally, this has a fixed depth, that means it could be 4 or 6, depth of 4 or 6. What is the implication is, I can have a nesting level in micro routines of 4 or 6 and beyond that nesting level is rarely, even nesting level of 4 in micro routines is, typically even a level of 1 is sufficient, but at most level of 2 because micro routines by themselves are not very large and not very complex. You may be talking of 
large micro programs may be few hundred words. 400, 500 words of microprogram is also very difficult to write and maintain. So, it is not very large in terms of nesting levels. So, 4 or 6 is what is maximum required. If it is just you require a nesting level of 1, you do not even need a stack. What do you need? You can just do with a register. Okay. So, for example, this is the type of customization I am talking about. So, look at your application, count your nesting level and you can customize this stack to the depth of the nesting level that you require in your design. So, once you have this, so that is a source for the next address. This branch address source is same as what you had before. This contains the branch address. So, now what and all branch addresses it will contain? Of course, it will contain the address for conditional jump. It will contain the address for jump. It will also contain the address for jump subroutine. The address, the micro routine from where it starts, the address of that also will be supplied by this branch address and these addresses are of course mutually exclusive you need to supply only one address in a given micro instruction some I will come back to this in a moment let me talk about this many of these next address multiplexes also support a zero many times especially when you are implementing complex state machines and so on there is a branch required directly to the zeroth state it is a is an initial state so you provide an option for zero which is if you can select it you can jump to the zeroth location even at the time of reset what happens is there is a reset pin also which i have not shown here the reset pin is so connected that actually the zero gets selected with the reset pin reset pin also goes to the select logic so that what happens is this at the time when you say press the reset button the zero gets selected zero comes over here and your micro program will start from the zeroth location so, that is how the reset is implemented. Now, let us come back to this. This is a very interesting concept of providing something typically what is done in the data part, you are moving it to the control part. Many times you have to implement loops. The loops that you need to implement, let us say we are talking of loops which are not really, okay. one type of loops could be fixed loops. That is, you know that you have to go 100 times, you have to go 200 times, you have to repeat a set of micro instructions some number of times, which is fixed. If you have a loop like that, the way you can implement it is you can after all transform a loop into a conditional jump. What you can do is you can make a comparison, keep this, uh, keep a register in your data part, make a comparison with you know some value that it reaches 100 times it has to go compare it with 100 and the comparator output is available as a status input as a condition input over here and you use that to perform a jump. So, that is one way of implementing a loop. An alternative way of implementing a loop is you maintain a loop counter over here decode 0 and use this decode 0 as one more input to the select logic. So, you can implement micro instructions micro sequencer instructions which are of the type that if the loop counter has hit 0, then do a branch. So, one of the conditions, so what is happening is instead of having that comparator outside and giving the status input, the comparison is being done internally. What is required is I push the number of times the loop needs to go, I have to push that into the loop counter at some time. And then I have to keep on decrementing it and checking whether it goes, it has reached 0 or not. So, let us say if I have to repeat it 100 times, I push value 100 and then check whether it has reached each time I decrement when the loop is over and I keep on dec you know making a jump. If it has hit 0, then I do something else. If it has not hit 0, I do something else. So, I perform the conditional jump using this as a condition input. But of course, now the issue is why I have connected this to the branch address. This has actually nothing at all to do with the branch address. I should actually have a separate input for this. After all, this is something the number of times the loop go has nothing to do with how many address lines that are there in the control ROM. These two are entirely independent things. But just to save on the number of pins, because otherwise I would need to provide extra pins for this. If I restrict my loop sizes to the same size as what is my maximum number of address lines, I can use the same lines for doing this. Only thing is at the time when I am loading the, loading the loop counter, the micro sequencer instruction that loads the loop counter, 
will not be able to do a conditional jump or a jump. It will be a continued type of an operation. It will go to the next micro sequence and instruction and it will load whatever value that is there into this. So, this is another thing that one provides over here a loop counter. Now, again here, if you look at the nesting level of the loops, you can increase the nesting level of this loop counter. You can not just make one register, but you can make multiple registers. You can implement it like a stack and keep on pushing the loop counter values depending upon, let us say you have two levels of nesting of the loop, you can push both levels of nesting of the loop into the values into this and check the innermost loop because that is the one that is going to be or you can keep a set of registers and choose. So, there are many methods of implementing this if you want to implement more than one loop. If you have one, more than one loop, but only one, one loop counter, you will use the implement this with for the innermost loop. For the other loop, you will implement it in the data part and check, take the status. The advantage of doing, doing this is saving in clock cycle. You do not have to have an additional clock cycle to decrement the counter or increment the counter in the data part and then do the comparison. It also decreases the number of status lines that come from the data part. It decreases the connectivity. Of course, at the expense of another sequence or instruction, but it does do that. Second, there are also other interesting ex uh, extensions that are possible. Let us say it is not that you know you are going to do it 64 times, but you have to repeat a loop a variable number of times. But this variable number of times does not change dynamically. It is not data dependent. It is fixed at the time when you start the loop. There is a register with value which contains the value and you have to go so many times depending on what the value of that register is. Even that can be implemented that register may be in the data part, but from that particular register, I need to provide a path to this. Either through a multiplexer or through a tri-state logic. And at the time, when I start the loop, I load the register value into this and then I can repeat it with this. So, the only thing that is not possible here is if the number of loops are not predicted at the time when you are entering the loop, then you do not use this. But if that is fixed at the time when you are entering the loop, even then you can perform this. This saves some hardware on the data part and it also makes the number of control steps that are states that are required to perform the loop also reduces by 1. And these type of a thing can be available to you as a standard package. You can actually get a package which has a sequencer and which contains all these. And this AMD 2910, as I told you, is actually has 12 address lines. All this path inside is 12 bits which means that it can address microprograms of size 4k words. The one more signal that I added apart from micro sequence or instruction, another signal I have added is a condition enable. Condition enable is nothing but a gating on the condition. So, it is basically condition enable should be true and then you check for the condition. So, this is just some extra gating that is provided. One could do this gating outside also, but here this gating is provided within the select So, these are the uh, typical sequencer instructions that are required. And now, if you look at the type of instructions that it will support, how the loop is implemented? You know, at the time when you are entering the loop, you know that how many, uh, let us say you talk in terms of a repeat loop. Okay, So, what is going to happen is, you load this value into this. And you have, we will have a micro sequence instruction, we will talk of this, which will keep on decrementing this value. And based on whether it is 0 or not, it will do a conditional jump. Because it is just going as an input, just like a condition input. It is another input to the select logic. And that particular micro sequence instruction will check this value. And if it has hit 0, then it will go somewhere. If it has not hit 0, it will go to another micro sequence instruction. So, once you are implemented, so once you have loaded the value, you are repeating it and then you are, in, you know, uh, so these are the micro sequencer instructions in a very generic way, okay. So, if you look at the specific chip, there, these instructions could be different, but I have written down some uh, micro sequence. So, next or continue, it just goes to the next micro instruction, which we have seen before. Jump conditional, okay, I wrote it as JMPC jump unconditional, jump 0, jump subroutine, 
return return is where at the end of the micro routine you have to say that so the return is like the return and unconditional jump are same it will go to the micro instruction but except that here it will take the return address from the stack rather than from the branch address load counter so load counter is going to load this because I'm sharing the branch address and this, I'm considering that. Of course, one can build a microsequencer when one doesn't share it. But in this case, I'm sharing it. So what happens is this value goes into the loop counter. And which is a sequencer instruction? Actually, as far as the sequencer is concerned, we are going to be just like next. We are going to go to the next micro instruction. Because at each micro instruction, I have to define what is the next micro instruction I'm going to go to. Repeat. Okay, I should say repeat decrement not zero. So this is at the end of the loop, I decrement the loop counter and I repeat, that is I go back if the it is not zero. So it is like if then else except that the condition is the output of the decode, decoder which says that whether the counter is zero or not. Return will, if you look at this, when I have a return, it will take this, this path. It will basically pop the stack and you will get the address from this. That's what the return will do. It's at the end of the micro route. So these are the type of se micro sequencer instructions that will be required to support such a micro sequencer and then we can utilize this. That is, <coughs> what it does is it decrements this loop counter it decodes whether the value is 0 or not. If the value is, re repeat if it is not 0. So if it is not 0, then it goes to the branch address that you are given. If it is 0, it goes to the next micro instruction. <laughs> so that means if you have a loop, there is some label and this is your repeat not 0 L1. So I come to this some micro instruction over here. I decrement this value. <coughs> and then if it is not 0, then I go back. Otherwise, I get out of the loop. So you can make a repeat loop out of it. See, now you can see that there is only one loop counter, so I don't have to identify here. If I have multiple loop, loop counter, I would have to have some type of a... Along with this, I have to add which loop counter I am checking. Because if you have two levels of nesting, three levels of nesting, I can extend that. But this is because I don't have, I have only one loop counter I know which is the one that's. <coughs> so, okay, so once we have discussed this micro sequencer, I will go and just to sort of clarify things, we will go back to the timing diagram. But before, I just put up, we already discussed this, I don't have to bother about details of this, but you, uh, these are the components and this is what is happening. Where is the clocking that's going on that's important to realize for timing, okay? Because we always assume that all our, our clock period is sufficient to take care of all combinational delays. So basically, as far as the clock edges are concerned, we are interested in where the clocking is taking place. So one clock is over here, micro instruction register. And the same clock is also being fed into the microprogram counter. There is only one component here, which is a synchronous component, which is the microprogram counter and the same clock is going over there. Now let us look at the overall timing because what is happening. So I generate the clock and I have the next address. I have written the micro sequencer instruction that I am giving along with each clock. So my next address is A. So when I have this next address A, I am going to be executing micro instruction corresponding to address A in the next clock cycle. Because what will happen is, if A comes here in this clock, MIA is going to come here after a delay, because control ROM just has a delay, and this will come here in the next clock. My, and this is what is being fed to the data part and that's what is going to be executed. MIA is going to be executed in the next clock. And let us say this MIA contains the microsequencer instruction next. Let's say this is the microsequencer instruction which is contained in MIA, I'm assuming. So what happens is, 
of this a plus 1 of course will not come immediately it will come after a certain delay <coughs> where does this delay come from this delay first of all comes from the delay of the register after the clock comes there is a delay of the register this sequencer instruction has to go over here and within the sequencer i have to select the output of the the next address multiplexer so all those delays will come and then a plus 1 will come after a small delay and once a plus 1 comes after some delay mi a plus 1 will come and that should come before the setup time of the micro instruction register so that i have mi a plus 1 micro instruction in the next clock cycle let us say this my mi a plus 1 actually contains jumps subroutine the address of the subroutine is given by b then after some time b address will come again control rom access time and again setup time before this so that i go to mib over here and in this manner this basically if you just relate it to at the higher level just like your fetch and decode of the processor instructions and this is what is happening the micro instructions are being fetched and executed fetch and executed so this is the time when the micro instruction is being fetched and this is the time when it is being executed and when you are executing it you should also define what is the next micro instruction that needs to be fetched and that's what is happening because it is a control part it is going to have each instruction each micro instruction is going to define what is going to be the next state you are going to any any state machine you have to say which next state similarly here you have to say which next micro instruction so that is how uh, this proceeds as far as the timing is concerned the last aspect that i want to discuss about sequencing is which is handled in a special way is what's called multi way branching we had this problem in the gcd example when we did the state machine we had a three way branch when we went to the microprime control we converted it into two two way branches but can we do three way branches if it is very critical can we do three way or four way branches yes we can we will consider two aspects of it one is generally for state machines how we do it and then we will consider in the context of the processors because many processors are microprogrammed internally you don't see the microprogram but the implementation of the control within the processor is in a microprogrammed manner so processor design is an important issue so we will also consider how processors implemented it when they do microprogram because there there is a branching multi way branching is very important at one stage we will discuss that so one method is to do multiple address fields it's expensive of course is applicable only if the address fields are small or multi way branches are very important and saving that one single clock cycle or few clock cycles is very important then we do multiple address fields we will see that the other two things are related to you can do address mapping through lookup tables or we can do address mapping through address translation and encoding i will come to explaining how this works in the context of process later first let's do what happens in multiple address fields consider this i am implementing this type of a control flow i am in state si if condition 1 comes i go to state si plus 1 if condition 2 comes i go to state sj if condition 3 comes i go to state sk this is very similar to what we had in the gcd case okay so three different conditions of course they have to be mutually exclusive and typically these are the only three branches then they should all you know if you take a or of all that that should be one remember si and si plus 1 can be implemented by the output of the incrementer because i'm just going to the next but sj and sk needs to be supplied so what i can do is the branch address input of the micro sequencer i can actually put a multiplexer at this input and supply both j and k addresses from my micro instruction format so my micro instruction format now will not contain just one branch address but i will contain two branch addresses i need to have fields for both supplying j and k i can use this condition 3 to multiplex between them but one of the conditions because now i am going to select this one of the conditions is going to be c2 or c3 if c2 or c3 is going to be there i am going to generate 
the branch address. But which branch address comes is determined by C3 itself, either J comes or K comes. So, I am done a two level of multiplexing. One is to determine which condition, so this particular condition is either C2 or C3, then this condition is going to be satisfied. But if C3 comes, then I will get K. If C2 comes, of course, it is actually C3 bar, but that is fine because C2 and C3 are first of all disjoint. They have to be disjoint in this type of situation. And in both cases, this condition is true, so I am going to select in C3 bar, I am going to select this. <coughs> so, of course, this type of an implementation is expensive. The reason it is expensive is I am going to have two fields now, both containing the branch addresses. And remember, if this is a large state diagram, there are 50 states and only this type of a branching occurs only one place, but this extra field is going to be there. So, my ROM size is going to increase, the width of it is going to increase considerably. Because if I have 50 states, I have 50 micro instructions, then I require at least 6, uh, six bits to address them. So, I require 6 bits for this, 6 bits for this, I require 12 bits in the micro instruction format. Sir, what is this data, uh, STM doing? That is just taking other, there could be other conditions one has to implement. So, I am, if I am only having this, then there is no, I am not considered what is happening in the rest of the state diagram, so I am not. So, what this is, can, in this case of course, is not doing very much, because it is just only one input you can give it. But if there are multiple other conditions, you have to do similar things for other conditions. So, that is selecting which condition to branch up. So, this is one type of an implementation. It can be done if there are address field bits are few, if it is a small and also this is too critical. Now, let us look at the processor problem. Processor problem is a slightly more trickier problem. Because when you do a processor design, all processors require a multi-way branch at one stage. When you have fetched the instruction, assume that you are talking of your processor. Processor has fetched the instruction. Depending on what instruction has been fetched, you have to do a multi-way branch. You have to go and execute the set of micro instructions required to implement that particular instruction. There may be 50 instructions, there may be 80 instructions. And let us say there are 50 instructions and these are encoded in 6 bits of opcode. If I keep on doing a two-way branch, that will be like a sequential decoding. If you do a two, keep on doing a two-way branch on a 6-bit opcode, I will require 6 cycles before I get to the proper opcode, decode. So, it will be a sequential decoding structure. So, that will take 6 cycles even to find which opcode it is. So, that is simply not affordable. You cannot do this type of a thing for when you are implementing a processor using a MacPram control. So, you need to do a multi-way branch. The multi-way branch, one way of doing a multi-way branch is you provide a mapping ROM. What you do is, in this particular ROM, you have stored the starting address of the set of micro instructions which implement a particular micro instruction. So, for every instruction in your processor, you have a set of micro instructions. That is the first thing. And they are stored in lo some starting some location. And which location they start, you store in the, micro in the mapping ROM. And this branch address, of course, may have more than one source. So, at the time when you do the, after you have finished your fetch, see, the, the what you call as fetch in your processor will be consisting of some set of micro instructions. You execute those micro instructions. At the end of it, you select the mapping ROM. Your instruction register already contains the instruction after you have done the fetch. So, this mapping ROM will contain the starting address of the set of micro instructions required to implement this instruction. So, you do it through a mapping ROM. And at that time, you disable the output that is coming from the branch address register. So, that branch address register that you have, after all, this branch address is coming from here. 
you should disable this particular, so you can make this register to be a tri-state register, you disable this register and get the address from the mapping ROM and you can do a multi-way branch. So, because now depending on which instruction is coming, so you just have a different source for the branch address and the, this defines, so depending on, it may have 100 instructions, you have 100 mapping locations and you can do a 100-way branch in just one cycle. Many times a simpler procedure is followed, you do not even need a mapping ROM. What you do is, from your instruction you compose the micro, starting of the micro instruction. You have some instruction bits, let us say you have 6 instruction bits, I0, I1, I5. These 6 instruction bits give you the opcode, this is the opcode. I add 2 zeros, let us say. And I add something over here. Let us say this becomes 6 plus 2, 8, and I add 0, 1, 1, 0. So, this is a 12 bit micro instruction address which is generated from directly from the opcode itself. So, the implication is, and I select this. So, instead of a mapping ROM, I have a translation, and I select this as the input of the branch address. What will happen is, in your microprogram ROM, Starting at 0, 1, 1, 0 and whatever is the opcode 0, 0, let us say the opcode is all zeros, that is an instruction, I will start storing the set of micro instructions required to execute that particular instruction. Similarly, everything else same 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, I will have for the opcode corresponding to 1, I will have the set of micro instructions starting here stored. If I, of course, I can fit all of them into four micro instructions, it is fine. If I cannot, then I, the last instruction, micro instruction could be a jump to another place where I can complete the set of micro instructions required. So, I can do a composition from the opcode itself. I can do a composition of the micro instruction address by just the translation. This is just, you know, offsetting it, translating it and so on. In this manner, I can compose. Of course, this makes the location of these corresponding micro instructions restricted but it is very successful in doing a multi-way branch. For every instruction, I can now directly get the starting address of the micro instruction. I can do away with this mapping ROM also. This is a mapping process, but does not require a ROM. Just some wires, wiring will do. And at this stage, you do not, should not select the address that is coming from the micro instruction, but you should select the address coming from the instruction register. And typically, sequencer provide a jump J map type of an instruction. What this instruction does is actually provides only an output and this output should enable the proper tri-state buffers. It is up to you to connect them in a manner so that the output coming from here, the tri-state buffer is enabled and the tri-state buffer that comes from the instruction register, from the micro instruction register gets disabled. Once you do that, then you have achieved a multi -way run. So, that completes the design of a micro sequencer. So, typically if you are supporting a multi-way branch, then you have to consider more options. If you are only supporting a two-way branch, you only have to cut down the sequencer that we had defined before, trim it down to the problem that you have at hand. With this, we will start.